evening. I hope everyone had a pleasant And it's in John chapter 7. As you have the oft, we, we quote that verse all the time, where the Lord says, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The context of the verse was the reading. Um, Jesus had done, and he does call it a work. It, that, that is an interesting thing, because he calls it a work there in verse 21. I did one work, and you all marvel. So you're going to have to ask yourself the question, was Jesus breaking the Sabbath by doing the work? He calls it a work. This isn't the disciples who are, who are shucking the grain when they're going through the fields because that wasn't considered work. But this, obviously, Jesus says, I did one work, and you all are behaving like this. But then he gives the example of those who would do the circumcisions. And he says, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? He wanted them to see that, in fact, he was not breaking the law. He, even as he did what he did, even as he calls it a work, that he was not breaking the law any more than those who were, doing, who were performing circumcision on the Sabbath were breaking the law, that that was not um, that was not breaking the law, that they needed to accept it, that just as you have someone on the Sabbath, not to get into the, um, not to be untactful, but if they could accept someone being physically hurt on the Sabbath, talking about the child being circumcised, if they could accept a child being hurt on the Sabbath, if they could accept something being removed on the Sabbath, then they should be able to accept someone being made whole on the Sabbath. And that's what he did. And then you have the quote, do not judge by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment. The title of tonight's sermon is Looking Below the Surface. And this concept of of judging with righteous judgment and not judging by appearances, I think it appears all throughout Scripture that God is constantly trying to get his creation to look more deeply into things and to be discerning. And that idea of discernment is really what we're going to be looking at, just three or four examples of it tonight. And I thought there's a, in our daily videos, if you by any chance or watching those. There's a daily video coming up this week, and I thought it was, it was an interesting one. There's three accounts in the Old Testament, and it's right around the vicinity of Saul going to the witch. But there are three, th there are three examples of discernment being called for all within about two chapters. One is Saul tells David and it's Saul, if you go back and you read it, Saul kind of flip-flops back and forth. He tries to kill him one chapter, and then the next chapter, Saul says, oh, everything's okay. And then the next chapter, he's trying to kill him again, and then it's, oh, I, I shouldn't be treating you like this. Well, at one point, Saul, and it's, he says, no, we're good, Every, everything's fine, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have tried to kill you. And David, effectively, David does not go along with Saul. And David says, he might try to kill me again. And my point is this, David was being discerning. That even though Saul said, now we're good, David said, well, okay, thank you, but I'm not going with you again. And he was showing some discernment. David then goes to the Philistines. And don't have time to get into it all, but he lied to the Philistines about what he was doing. And the king of the Philistines believed it. The soldiers of the Philistines did not. You can go back and read the account yourself. It's interesting. <laughs> but it's another case where discernment was called for. And then Saul goes to the witch. And do you remember when Saul goes to the witch? He doesn't go looking like the king of Israel. He disguises himself. And then the witch does what she does. And lo and behold, who is it who shows up? Samuel. And then all of a sudden, the witch turns to Saul and says, you're the king of Israel. 
and Saul had deceived her by his disguise, and she had believed it. She had believed it, and the, one of the lessons you can make with all those is that people need to be discerning because appearances can be deceiving. And that idea, what it calls for is discernment and looking below the surface. Here in John chapter 7, and that was just a plug for the daily video, by the way. Here in John chapter 7, they're condemning Jesus, and he says, y'all need to be more discerning that I have not, in fact, broken the law, that I have actually made a man whole on, on the Sabbath. But that, the idea of, of being careful, being discerning, I would suggest all through Scripture, the Lord is trying to get his people to understand this lesson. So let's go ahead and get into it. Four examples. The first one, or three examples, three or four. The first one is Jesus himself. Come to Isaiah 53. In Isaiah 53, we have the, I guess you would call it a prophecy. It's a prophecy about what Jesus is going to look like. But in Isaiah chapter 53, despite how all the pictures portray him, um, in Isaiah 53, verse 1, Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus was not comely, is what it says. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. To compare Jesus to some of the individuals we've already mentioned, Jesus was not like Saul, head and shoulders. It calls Saul that he was very handsome. Right? It says he was handsome, head and shoulders above all Israel. That's not Jesus. <laughs> That's just not Jesus. He's not like David in 1 Samuel 16. David is called ruddy and good looking. That's not Jesus either. He's, that, he is not good looking. He's not like Absalom. In 2 Samuel 16 it says, With Absalom there is no blemish upon him that no one was more handsome than Absalom. That's not Jesus. It's just, it's just not. Joseph in Genesis 39 is called handsome. Again, that's not Jesus. It's just that's, that's not who Jesus, that's not what he looked like. And, and as we think about it, I would suggest it was intentional. And I think that's the interesting part that if it was prophesied what he would look like, that means this was not just happenstance, that it was actually intentional that he would not be, as this verse says, that he would have no form or comeliness, that there would be no beauty that we should desire him. Lily up here, she's... These, these last, this last week or two, it's been kind of odd, she's been learning about human biology in science class. And she's coming home saying strange things like, I get 23 chromosomes from mom and I get 23 chromosomes from dad. And we start having those sorts of discussions. You know, and for those of you who, who know my parents, and you know what my parents look like, and Gail, I won't call you out. I'm not looking for an amen on this. Could you tell by looking at my parents who I'm related to? Some of you, Gail, one of them, knows my grandparents. And you, you can see the eyes coming down through generations. You can see, you know, you can see the ears coming down through generations. You can see the whatever facial structures coming down through generations. Who did Jesus get his looks from? I'll tell you right now, it wasn't Joseph. <laughs> it was prophesied that there would be nothing comely about him. It was intentional that he would look this way, that he would look as, as Isaiah speaks about it. And what it is, I, I would suggest, as we think about it, we love him not because of his physical appearances, that what we are doing, what it does is it calls us to look below the surface because even though his, his outward appearance 
There is nothing, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Okay, do you desire Jesus? <laughs> do you want to see Jesus one of these days? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But it's not based on what he looked like as the carpenter's son. It's not based on that. What it does is it calls us to look below the surface because there is no one who has ever been born of woman. There is no one who has ever been as beautiful and as handsome and as magnificent as Jesus. No. It just so happens it's not based on looks. <laughs> that it calls us to look below the surface. It calls us to not judge by appearance, but with righteous judgment. It calls us to be more discerning and to, to do as we're speaking about, to look below the surface. The second example I have is in Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John are, are on trial. In Acts chapter 4, and we've, we've looked at this passage recently in talking about the, the man who was healed, when Peter says, I, have, I do not have money, but then the man was healed, and then Peter and John are arrested. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If, this, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless, done to a helpless man, by what, be, what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Right, verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Judging by appearances, what were Peter and John? They were, <laughs> to use this, this verse, they were uneducated and untrained. King James is unlearned and ignorant. That's, man, that sort of gets kind of close to home. And you know what? I looked up what the Greek words were here for unlearned and ignorant, and the King James is actually being nice. <laughs> the Greek words are what's up on the screen now. The first one is agrammatos. Agrammatos. So it's without grammar. And the second one is idiotes. You need me to explain that one to you? Those are the Greek words. And I read that, and I think, man, sheesh, give a guy a chance, will you? <laughs> That's how they were perceived. They were perceived this, this way. As you think about it, I wonder how, how they had perceived that. How had they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant? Perhaps they lacked some sort of oratorial polish, Perhaps they had lacked some sort of custom. I, I don't know. It doesn't go into detail. But they perceived it somehow. They perceived it somehow, and they came to the conclusion that they had been with Jesus. Regardless, whatever the case may be, they had not been. Um, I was listening to one of Alan Yater's lessons, uh, of the one about prejudice, I believe from Monday. And he was speaking about their schools, the Jew schools, the rabbinical schools. And... Peter and John had not gone to those schools. Jesus had not gone to those schools. And there was some prejudice there. But yet when we back up and we think about it, and we think, no, Peter and John had not, they were unlearned and uneducated from that perspective, and yet we ask the question, how much have they taught us? How much, how much have we learned from Peter? Just think about all the lessons that we've learned from Peter. You might think good or bad. <laughs> but how many good lessons have we learned from Peter? Oh, these guys, they're just dumb fishermen from Galilee. You know who you can learn from? <laughs> dumb fishermen from Galilee. <laughs> because they're really not dumb fishermen. They're fishers of men. But as you think about it, as we think about it, we just think how many things we've learned from Peter. How many things have we learned from the Apostle John? How many things have we learned from the Apostle James? On the surface, what, did they, what were they on the surface? Well, they're unlearned and they're ignorant. But are they really unlearned and ignorant? Not really. 
They had been with Jesus. They had learned from Jesus. Even Paul, Paul's the one who, Paul's the one, you know, born out of due time. He's the oddball. Because unlike Peter, James, John, or any of the others, Paul had been taught in their schools. Paul had been taught up, he had been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. And yet when he talks about his own, what he taught, he says that the things that I teach, I did not learn from man. That he had learned them from God by direct revelation from Galatians chapter 1. Well, what that means is that the things that he learned, and it's exactly what he says in another place when he talks about that if anybody could boast about the things in the flesh, he could boast, he could boast more. And then he says, and how do I think of them? I count them as dung. That those things were not what the gospel was based on. And that the things that he taught, the gospel that he taught, had not come from Gamaliel, it had come from the Lord himself. But back to Peter and John, just as we, as we think about them. I wonder how many Jews rejected the gospel. Because when they saw the teachers of the gospel, they just saw unlearned and educated. They, they didn't see the, the highfalutin rabbis. You know, they didn't see the, the rabbi, the ones who loved to be called rabbi, the ones who stood on the street corners praying, the ones who blew the trumpet before they did anything. They, they, didn't, see, they didn't see Peter and, and John and the others, they didn't see them doing any of these things. And I wonder how many of the Jews hung their hat on those things. You know, I remember talking to a fellow one time, and he was, he was in a denomination, and he had his... Um, the diploma from where he went to school up on the wall. And it was a, a Pentecostal college. And he made the statement, he said, I don't think any, he said, I don't think anybody could be a pastor without that. He said, I don't, and he was talking about preaching, but he said, I don't think anybody could be a preacher without that. And I said, well, I guess you don't have much use for Peter, James, John, or the apostles, or Jesus, because they didn't go to that college. Um, but we can have the same sort of mentality. I've shared this before, and this is nothing against this is nothing against Florida College, nothing against Florida College. But if every preacher knows, when you go places, within the first five questions, one of the questions that is always asked to preachers is, "Where did you go to school?" I wonder what they asked preachers before the 1950s, before the college was established, or the 1940s, or whenever it was. But anyway, nothing against the college, but we can, we can go down the same rabbit hole. We can we cannot look beyond the surface, below the surface. Peter and John, uneducated, and yet they have taught us so much, and it calls us to look below the surface, to judge with righteous judgment, and not judge by appearances. Now we turn to Paul. Come over to, to Corinthians. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. As Paul goes out and he's teaching the Gentiles, churches are popping up as people are obeying the gospel. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 7, 2 Corinthians 10 at verse 7 says, For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters, uh, when we are absent, such we will also be indeed when we are present. As we look at this verse and, and we think about the concept, even the Gentiles had to learn this lesson. There were, though, there were at least some in Corinth who were making, making these sort of these sorts of statements, and even the Gentiles had to learn to judge with righteous judgment and to not judge by appearances. Paul's speech, he was not an eloquent speaker, apparently, as it speaks about his. His speech is contemptible. He was not an eloquent speaker like Apollos. But the thing is, the truth does not hang on whether or not the person is an eloquent speaker or not. The truth does not hang on that. The truth hangs upon the truth, whether it is true or not. 
whether the presenter has great oratorial skills like it seems Apollos had, or whether they are, as Paul is here in this accusation being made against him, whatever the case may be, the truth is the truth. Paul's, as we think about his physical appearance, and it's, as it says here, his bodily presence is weak. And his, his presentation was deemed lacking. What he looked like, what he sounded like, that, that it seemed lacking by some, his, his presentation as it is. What lesson did they need to learn, the Corinthians? At least some there in Corinth. I don't think everybody there in Corinth felt this way, but at least some of them did. And they were making some fairly um, hefty accusations against him, um, if you're familiar with the letters. And the lesson they had to learn is you don't judge by appearances that you judge righteously. You don't judge the book by its cover. You have to look more deeply into it. And there were at least some there who were, who were nearly rejecting Paul. And as they were rejecting Paul, they were throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And what I mean by that is by rejecting Paul, you're going to end up rejecting the gospel that Paul preached. And apparently a part of their rejection was based upon what he looked like and what he sounded like. And what did they have to do? Don't judge by appearances. Look more deeply into this and judge with righteous judgment. Like I said, I think the Lord has been trying to get his people to understand that going all the way back to the beginning. When Eve looked at that tree, and you have those three phrases being used for the tree, one of them being, she saw it and it was pleasant. Now, was it really pleasant? <laughs> well, it looked that way. <laughs> but can appearances be deceiving? And that's what it is. Appearances are deceiving. And it's, it's a sad thing. So going all the way back to the beginning, the Lord has wanted his people to have discernment. And I think the same thing goes, goes for us. Come to 1 Corinthians 1 now. When we think about who obeys the gospel. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, at verse 26. In 1 Corinthians 1 at verse 26, and we're hopefully familiar with the context of chapter 1. Verse 18, for example, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's another example of you have to look below the surface. It's like you look at the gospel, you look at the message of the cross, and what does the world see it as? It's, this is insane. You guys go to church twice on Sundays? You know it's Easter, right? And you're going back to church Sunday night? That's crazy. That's how the world looks at it. You go to church on Wednesday too? What are you guys, a bunch of zealots? Why do we do what we do? Why do we obey the message of the cross? That which seems foolish to the world, do we think that it's foolish? No, we think it's the wisdom of God. To, and it's just as we, as we look at those who obey, look at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ. Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. Even in obeying the Lord and even in spreading the message of the cross, what do we have to see? Don't judge by appearances. Who is it who's going to end up coming to John the Baptist to be baptized? At one point, it talks about all Judea came out. But it's interesting because the Pharisees came out, and John the Baptist says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Because they weren't turning from their sins. Who was it who was turning from their sins? Who would have ever thought that the tax collectors and the harlots and the sinners would be worthy candidates to be added to the kingdom? 
surely, surely the gospel is more suited for the mighty and the noble and the wise according to the flesh. Surely the gospel is more suited for them, right? Nope. You got to flip it. <laughs> you got to flip it. Because God has chosen the things which are despised and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Not many wise according to the flesh come. Not many mighty come. Not many noble come. And I would suggest those who do come, what they have to do is what Paul had to do. I count those things at dung. Because a person that is qualified is not qualified because they have a lot of money. A person who's qualified is not qualified because of whoever their family is. A person who's qualified is not qualified because of the reputation they have in some community. That's not what qualifies a person. What qualifies a person is whether they will humble themselves and turn from their sins and submit themselves to the Lord. And it's just an amazing thing. As we think about this concept of that we don't judge by appearances, that we judge with righteous judgment. And we are, we are constantly being called to look below the surface. And as, as we get older, the lesson gets more and more obvious. Because as the outer man perishes, what does the inner man do? The inner man is renewed day by day. As our outer man is just falling apart, the inner man is looking more and more to the finish line. It is how the Lord wants it to be. And that means we look below the surface. And we have, we have more discernment but as we offer the invitation and we just see whether we're talking about Jesus or whether we're talking about the apostles or whether we're talking about those who obey the gospel or whether we're talking about we ourselves we always look below the surface and we don't judge a book by its cover we don't judge by appearances we judge with righteous judgment and that requires discernment if you're here this evening, if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, you know, I was, I was thinking about the day of Pentecost and all those folks who obeyed the gospel, the 3,000. You know, they didn't have a baptistry, right? <laughs> they didn't have a baptistry. And there were, there were a ton of people in Jerusalem, a whole lot more than 3,000. There was a ton of people. But let's, let's just use, and there was a lot more people than live in Columbus, but let's just use Columbus for, for an example. Would it make the news if all of a sudden 3,000 people all went out to the river there at Mill Race to be baptized? If it wasn't just one person, and it wasn't just 10 people, and it wasn't just 50 people, if all of a sudden 3,000 people went out there and they were baptized, would that make the news? People would wonder, what is going on? That's what was happening in Jerusalem. They weren't going to a baptistry. They were going to some body of water. We don't know where they went. They went somewhere where there was water. Where, wherever they went, you don't think people wondered, wait a minute. What are these, what are these, what's this group of, what are they doing? So you have this sermon with Peter and the other apostles it's like, okay, there's, there's 12 guys, and they're preaching. And then you have, wait a minute, 3,000 people are doing what? And it, it's just an amazing scene. And, and here's my point. If you didn't know any better, what would you think about it? You would think, what are they, crazy? <laughs> what are they doing? We're Jews. You don't do that. <laughs> You don't do that. What are they doing? They're doing something different. They're doing something different than us. And it would have seemed, it would have seemed odd to the outsider. And as we offer the invitation, does baptism seem odd to the world? Does baptism seem odd to the outsider? We may have family members who aren't Christians and they think, really? You're going you're gonna to join yourself to that? And the answer is yeah. Why? Because the message of the cross is foolishness to them, but to us it's the wisdom of God. Because we know what Jesus did. And on this day of all days, we are reminded of what Jesus did.
Now, am I talking about the first day of the week or am I talking about the Lord's resurrection? Uh, all of the above. <laughs> because we know what he did. We know that he went to the cross. We know he came from the tomb. He ascended into heaven. And we recognize what he did. And we want to be a part of that. And so we follow him because very simply that's what Christians do. We follow him. And so we turn from our sins, we confess him, that he is the son of God, and we're baptized. And other people may think, wow, that seems really silly. That's okay, because we don't judge by appearances. Would you say that when we first obey the gospel, that that may be the first time in our lives, when we, when we obey the gospel the first time, that may be the first time in our lives that we judge with righteous judgment. Perhaps, you may just think about that. As we, as we judge with righteous judgment and we simply say it's the right thing to do and we come to the Lord. The lesson is yours. If you're here tonight and would like to respond in putting on Christ in baptism for the remission of your sins, please come tonight while we stand and while we...